Bust out those learning caps. It's time to do some nerd stuff. So when it comes to building an engine, there's a lot of engineering and science and math and numbers and things that are involved in the order of timing events within your engine. They all have to work together for your engine to be efficient and reliable for years to come. But a lot of this math and figure out numbers and dial indicators and degree wheels and fancy tools can be really intimidating if you're just starting out to learn how to build an engine and what even all these things are. It doesn't really have to be that complicated though. With a lot of these measurements, basically what you're doing is you're just trying to find the average. So you go this far on this side, this far on this side, add them together, divide by two, and that's the center. Now the first thing we're gonna do is work on our camshaft. When you're building an engine brand new and you get that camshaft from a box and you pull it out, it's gonna come with a cam card. Now this is where you can go into cam degreeing or cam phasing because essentially you're checking to make sure that the cam that's in the box actually matches the card that's in the box. Why is that important? 99.98746% of the time, the cam is gonna be exactly what the cam company puts in the box. That very small percentage of the time, it's misboxed or something, or misground. Maybe there's a lemon in the factory and a batch went out that was weird and they, nobody's caught it yet. And you put it in your engine, put your engine all together, put it in your car and it doesn't work right. This is where you wanna check that. However, as you remember from the previous video I did on this engine and I've explained it a bunch of times. I don't know what this camshaft is. I can't identify the numbers, hours and hours and hours of scouring the internet and going on forums and posting questions and nobody can seem to figure out what it is. I do know a couple of things. It did come with this engine. I have all of the lifters. This is definitely a hydraulic roller camshaft and that's the extent of my knowledge for this camshaft. So what if you don't have a cam card? Should you still check it? Great question. Short answer is yes, you should still check it. Follow up question, well how do I check it if I don't have a cam card? This is where your knowledge of how the camshaft works actually is gonna come into play. So let's walk through these steps. The very first thing you wanna do is install your number one piston, and I'm doing all of these without rings, that way they can just kinda of move up and down freely. But since the piston doesn't have rings, it is gonna to want to rock back and forth. So you're gonna to wanna to put your dial indicator as close to the center as possible. Now what we're looking for is what's called true top dead center. You can line up the dots and get pretty close to top dead center, but unless you measure with a dial indicator and a degree wheel, then you don't know that you're 100% at true top dead center. So I went ahead and installed my degree wheel. Pretty self-explanatory, you don't need me to show you that. And the first thing you're gonna do is just kind of line up your dots on your timing set. And when you install your degree wheel, put your pointer right at top dead center. And at this point, it doesn't matter what your dial indicator says, you're just gonna rotate it until it stops. One key point though is you always want to be tightening. You always want to be going the rotation of your engine because there is a little bit of slack in that timing gear. So if you go past it, then go back farther than you need to and then go back forward and really try to be careful to sneak up on it. So once you get it to stop, that's where you want to zero your dial indicator. And then we'll go forward to 50 thousandths. to be pretty much about 12. So then we'll go backwards, go past it, and then sneak up on it. So that looks to be 11 and a half. So we're, there's about a half a degree difference. So I'm just gonna move my pointer now, just a hair this way. And then we'll go back the other way. slightly past the 11 so I'm gonna go not quite to 12 that's like 11 and three quarters so we'll spin this back the other way again go past it and then sneak up on it it's pretty much 11 and three quarters so now we know when we go back to zero our degree wheel should be dead on top dead center boom top dead center 
Okay, so now when you're really degreeing a cam, you're gonna wanna try to find the intake center line so you can match that up with your cam card. And to do that, we're gonna put some lifters in our lifter valley. And whenever you install roller lifters, this link bar goes towards the inside of the engine. Sometimes you can get these flipped around. If you've got an arrow on there, it'll say which side is up. This one doesn't have an arrow, so I'm gonna put it in like this. Wouldn't hurt to rub a little tiny bit of oil on these as well. And then we'll rotate the engine until our intake lifter is all the way at the bottom. And then we'll put our push rod on there and you wanna make sure that this is directly in line with your lifter. And we'll put our dial indicator on the push rod and you want a little bit of tension on this so it'll hold it in place. And we'll test it by giving it a few rotations just to make sure our dial indicator is holding the push rod in place and it's not gonna fall out of there. You also wanna to look to make sure it's not gonna bottom out. I think we're good. Now we're gonna rotate the engine until we find peak lift, which is where the dial indicator will go all the way around and then stop. It's right about there. And back up on it and just we'll double check that. Once it gets to peak lift, it will kind of hang out for a second. We'll zero that out. So we're gonna rotate the engine backwards and then we're gonna go forward again until we get to 50 thousandths before peak lift. It's right there. And then we'll take a peek at our degree wheel and we'll write that down. And then we'll rotate until we're 50 degrees after peak lift. We'll write that number down. So then you're gonna add these two together and divide by two, and that's your intake center line. So I got 107.5, you can call it 108. This is the point where you're gonna to wanna to check your cam card to make sure that it matches what your cam card says. If it's off, then this is where you're gonna to want to advance or retard your cam gear set to get within that range. Chances are you're gonna be pretty close or exactly right on to what your cam card says. Now, as I mentioned, I don't have a cam card, so I'm gonna keep going to figure out my specific cam specs. We'll do the exact same process to get the exhaust center line, and this will give us our lobe separation angle. So since we're already set up, we'll go ahead and put it on the exhaust lobe and repeat the same process. Trying to find the exhaust center line is a little bit different than the intake center line, and it can get a little bit confusing because as you see on the degree wheel, it doesn't have 360 degrees. Even though this is 360 degrees, it actually stops at 180 and then continues to go down this way. So top dead center is actually zero, and it goes up this way and up this way. This one actually makes it a little bit easier. This is the Mr. Gasket one. Down here, this is the intake center line area, but on the exhaust center line, you're up here, which if you continue to go forward, that would actually be 200 something degrees. But going backwards from top dead center, that brings you into your exhaust center line, which is between 100 and 120 up here. Again, nerd, math stuff, it can get very confusing, but we're gonna count backwards to get the exhaust center line. So to find the lobe separation angle, we're just gonna add the intake and the exhaust and divide by two, and that'll give our lobe separation. And now the next measurement we wanna get is our lobe lift. And this is a really simple setup. You just go to the base circle. You'll know you're on the base circle of the cam because your dial indicator is not moving. Once you're on the base circle, zero out your dial indicator. And then once your dial indicator starts to move, you'll just count the rotations until you get all the way up to peak lift. Once the dial indicator stops moving, you're at peak lift, and then you'll just write that number down. Once you got the measurement for the exhaust, then you can do the exact same thing by moving over to the intake lifter. When you get that measurement, write it down. Now we have our lobe lift. Now we can figure out what the valve lift is, and this is where you want to go to your stock rocker arm ratio for your engine, for a Chevy, Small block, the stock rocker ratio is 1.5. So we're gonna multiply our lobe lift times 1.5, and that's gonna give us our valve lift. The next thing we're gonna measure is our duration. And your cam card might have two different specs for this, one at six thousandths of lobe lift, and one at 50 thousandths. Six thousandths was kind of the old way of doing it, and that's what's known as the advertised duration. The 50 thousandths tappet lift is what 
pretty much everybody uses nowadays. So yours might not even have the advertised lobe lift. We're just gonna focus on the 50 thousandths lobe lift. This is a pretty simple measurement. Since we're already zeroed out on the base circle, you just rotate it until it just starts to lift, go to 50 thousandths, and then check your degree wheel, and then go all the way around. And then when that thing starts to close, go all the way to 50 thousandths of being back on the base circle. Check your degree wheel, add the two numbers together, and that's your lobe duration. And then we'll just do the exact same thing for the exhaust. Okay, so the next thing we need to check is our piston to deck height clearance. And this is important to know so that we can calculate our compression ratio. There's a couple of different ways you can do this. You can buy a deck bridge that you can mount your dial indicator in, or I'm gonna show you a much simpler way to do it. All you gotta do is verify we're on top dead center again, set up your dial bore gauge, zero it out when it's on the block, and carefully rotate it over to the center of your piston and note the difference. Another way you can verify this is by putting a stop across here and using your feeler gauge to see if you can get the right feeler gauge under there. The stock small block Chevy piston to deck height clearance is 25 thousandths, which means this has been decked 10 thousandths. So now the final thing we're gonna do is calculate our compression ratio. Now why is compression ratio important to know? because this will tell you the overall health and efficiency of your engine. If these numbers aren't correct, your engine isn't going to be working correctly and it probably won't last very long. So these numbers are very important to check as you're building or even before you start building your engine. Now there's three different numbers that we need to know. There's the static compression ratio number, the dynamic compression ratio, and the quench. So the biggest reason why compression ratio is important to know is because you don't want detonation. Now what is detonation? Basically detonation or knocking is when the air and fuel mixture inside your cylinder wall starts to fire off when it's not supposed to. As that piston starts to compress all of that air and fuel, it can create heat. And what might happen are little, little fireworks. You don't want fireworks. You want that to be compressed in just the right manner so that when your spark plug lets off a spark, it ignites more like a flamethrower, not fireworks. Detonation can ruin your day in a hurry because it'll basically destroy your engine. Nobody wants that. So all of these numbers are really important to keep us in the safe zone so that we avoid that. Now, what is the safe zone? There's a lot of different things that you'll find online. Generally, the consensus is if you're running pump gas, meaning anything from 87 to 91 premium or 93, or I like to run clear premium that has no ethanol in it, your static compression ratio should be somewhere around 10 or 10 and a half. You push it past 10 and a half, closer to 11, you might be able to do it depending on a lot of other variables. If your compression ratio gets too high, then that's when you're gonna not be able to run a pump gas anymore. You'll have to run race gas at like $40,000 a gallon. Some other contributing factors include how you're gonna use the engine. If you're gonna be under a lot of load, like you're gonna be towing a trailer or something, then you generally wanna keep it down lower. Another determining factor is what heads you're using. Cast iron heads generally will run hotter, so that heat of that compression stroke and the heat that are, that's in your cylinder heads might cause detonation. But if you're running aluminum cylinder heads, aluminum dissipates heat a lot better so you can get away with a little bit higher compression. General consensus with dynamic compression ratio, again, depending on all those other factors, is around eight and a half to one. So what is static compression ratio? Static compression ratio boiled down basically is the ratio between the volume in your cylinder when your crank is all the way at bottom dead center compared to when it's all the way at top dead center. How do you calculate static compression ratio? You basically just need to know six things. First, you need to know your bore size. You need to know your stroke. You need to know the CC volume of your heads and the CC dish or dome of your pistons. You need to know the compressed gasket thickness of your head gasket 
and the piston to deck clearance. And that's it. You can go online and you can search for compression ratio calculators and you'll find a whole bunch of them will pop up. One that I like to use for static compression ratio is from summitracing.com. All you gotta do is punch in your numbers, hit calculate, boom bada boom, that's your static compression ratio. So now how do you calculate dynamic compression ratio? Dynamic compression ratio is a little bit more accurate to how your engine is actually functioning because as the pistons are moving up and down, that valve will stay open just a little bit as it's coming up. So with that valve open, it's relieving some of the compression. So it has to do with the timing of your camshaft events. Your cam card typically will have these timing events on there, but if you don't have those, well then what do you do? I found a really cool website called gofastmath.com that has a lot of really cool information on there, not just compression ratios, but they have a dynamic compression ratio calculator and you can go in with the numbers off of your camshaft card, or in my case, what I've found doing these tests and things, and it'll spit out actually what your cam is actually doing. Now you can take these numbers, go over to their dynamic compression ratio, punch in all your static compression numbers and the cam timing numbers, and that'll spit out your dynamic compression ratio. Now mine is a little bit on the high side. This is an engine that's being specifically built to go into my 1958 Chevy pickup, and I don't know that I'll be doing some towing with it, but I might. I am running aluminum heads, so that's actually gonna help out quite a bit, but I really wanna stick close to that safe range, because I am planning on running pump gas if I go on a road trip. Now let's talk about the third factor for compression ratio, quench. Quench is the squish between the top of your piston and the bottom of your cylinder head. So the tighter the quench is, obviously your compression ratio is gonna go way up. The looser your quench is, it's actually not gonna make your engine very healthy. So to calculate quench, you just take your piston to deck height clearance and you add it to the compressed thickness of your gasket. There is a range you wanna look for. The general consensus for a safe range seems to be around 40 to 45 thousandths. Well, I hope this helped demystify some of the nerd stuff. All of the nerdy math stuff does matter when it comes to building your engine. If you found this useful, make sure you hit that like button down there while you're at it hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification so that you can follow along with the rest of this build. Get yourself a t-shirt or a hat or something fun over here. Check out the social medias and I'll see you on the next one.